Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made, so let's rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to your Father's house. In the early church, they began a tradition that we continue on Easter Sunday. The pastor says, Christ is risen, and the congregation responds with, He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Pray with me, please. Our Father, on this wonderful Easter Sunday in the year of our Lord, 2024, we give you thanks for that Easter long, long ago. When those who followed Jesus, the, the women that is, got up early on that first Easter Sunday and went to that garden, that cemetery, and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. We thank you that Jesus was and is alive. And that in the promise of the resurrection is the promise of our resurrection when we trust in Jesus. We also know, God, that our hearts are tender on Easter. Tender as we think about those who have preceded us into your heaven. So may our tears find that they fall down on smiles. May our sadness be mingled with joy as it was for those first Christians who realized that their loved ones who loved you had fallen asleep in the Lord. Be with us today, we ask. Please inhabit our praise. Teach us in your word. Send us out to share the good news of the resurrection. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, amen. Would you do me a favor and find that little yellow attendance card that's in the pew rack? It's right in front of you. So those who are guests this morning and those who are members, please sign that card. Put your name. And if you're a first-time guest, we'd like to have either your email address or your cell phone number so we can reach out and tell you a little bit more about our church. Sign up here for the Wednesday night dinner. We're having breakfast just like we had uh, breakfast this morning. Uh, wonderful Easter breakfast, and thank you to those who made that possible. A big shout out to the youth and uh, Jason Gatlin for the sunrise service. It was wonderful. And then a big shout out to Lisa Hart and uh, Jason Gatlin, Tracy Gatlin, all that team for a Easter egg hunt yesterday that was, I think, the biggest we've ever had. Beautiful weather. It was a wonderful day. If you'll look with me on the back of the bulletin, let me just highlight a couple of things. Uh, our new organ fund is almost halfway to the goal of 65000 uh, Renee and I have made a special offering for Easter above our tithes and other offerings to give to get that up to where we need it, and I invite you to join us. I hope that you will. Next Sunday, I'm having a pastor's lunch that I do usually about quarterly for those who are interested in learning more about the Christian faith and more about Highland Heights. I'd love to have you join me. We'll meet in the fellowship hall for about an hour, and we'll have a good lunch, spaghetti, I believe. We'll also have time for Q&A. Welcome to your father's house. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let's all stand or rise on this risen Sunday as we sing our first song, Glorious Day. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my dream Till I met you I was breathing 
Please join with me in our call to worship coming from Psalm 30, verses 4 and 5. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his. Praise Weeping may remain for a night. But comes in the Let's continue in worship singing a song that we all know called Jesus Messiah. Thank you. 
With those making profession of faith and their families, please come and join me on the chancel. I want you to pay attention, please, to those who are coming up here. Our confirmation class, our catechism class kids, uh, five of them are here, and uh, two of them are not here today. They are they always go and celebrate Easter in Camden with their family, so we'll welcome them next Sunday. But I want you to notice the ages of the people coming up here. You see parents and grandparents. You see children ranging in age from, I believe, 9 to 16. And then you also see a gentleman who is 72. Is that right? A gentleman who is 72 from Mongolia. God draws us to Jesus in different ways, at different ages, in different places. But almost always, it happens in the context of worship. These children and this gentleman 
have been worshiping at Highland Heights. And God has spoken to their hearts about who He is and that He wants to forgive them and have them live with Him forever. What a joy it is on Easter Sunday to welcome them into our church family. So I'm going to ask them the questions of membership. Lisa Hart, one of our elders, is going to hold the bowl as I baptize three of these folks. Three of them were baptized when they were children, and so today is a confirmation of the promise that God asked them to keep in the lives of their children. All right, are y'all ready? I want to get where people can see you, so I'm going to come down here for a minute. All right. Do you admit that you're sinners? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? Are you sorry for your sins? Do you promise to serve Christ in this church? And then do you submit yourself to the leadership in this church, Pastor Tim and the other elders? All right. A beautiful thing will happen with me, Gumbo, when he goes back to Mongolia and starts going to church with Amah's mother, he never has before, then our elders will transfer his membership to a church in Mongolia. It's a beautiful testimony to God's love no matter what you are, who you are, where you live. Jesus is for everyone. All right, let me baptize Ollie. Okay, buddy. Oliver Bailey, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I love you. Let's come over here and do both. Come here, bud. Bo Schmidt, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Love you, buddy. Would you kneel for me? Thank you. Maya Gump, upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I love you, brother. You can stand. Miss Renee is giving the kids their Bibles. They, uh, they studied the catechism. They studied hard. They did so well. And we picked out some children's Bibles for them. We will also get a Bible uh, in Mongolian to give uh, to Maya Gump. And we'll send that to him. We hopefully will get it there soon. God is good today and every day. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for all the ways that you draw us to yourself, through family, through church, through the Bible, through that inner knowledge we have that we've made mistakes and we want to make them right, and you've sent Jesus to do that for us. Please take care of all of these young folks and their families. Take care of our new brother who will soon return to Mongolia. May the lives of each one of the people on this chancel show forth the light of your Son that others may come to know you as well. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Okay, once you have your Bible and your certificate, you can go sit down. Thank you. Love you, darling. It's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord this morning, a blessing to be able to celebrate our risen Lord, our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, it's so hard to get up here and even speak after seeing something like that, profession of faith, and three baptisms in one day. You know, and I know uh, you, could, you could hear Brother Tim get choked up as he was baptizing, and as a minister, you know, if you can even baptize one person and lead them to the path of paradise, with our Lord and Savior and our Father in heaven. You've accomplished a wonderful thing. And we got to see three this morning. A man who's lived his entire life, 72 years old, who decided to give his soul, his heart, to Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful, it's a, it is a beautiful thing. You can look around religions all over the world and the fact that we celebrate a, a risen Savior on Easter you ain't going to find a prophet in the other religions that is alive to this day. All their prophets are dead. But we get to say that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is risen. We get to say that we'll meet him again, that he will come back for us one day. And we can leave this earth behind, all this pain, all this violence, and all this suffering to experience a paradise far beyond anything that you can imagine in this life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for this day, Father, for the many blessings that you've given us. Father, we thank you for this blessing, this special blessing that you've given us today, getting to watch all of these professions of faith and these baptisms, Lord. We know it is our duty as Christians, as ministers of your word, to bring others closer to you, to reveal your word to them so they can open your heart to it, Father, and you've shown us that today. Father, we'll never be able to repay you for the grace and mercy that you give us. Father, we offer up our sins to you, knowing that the price has been paid by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who got up on that cross and suffered, was spit on and humiliated for our sins, Lord, not for his. Father, we offer those sins to you. We ask for strength to turn away from them, God, and we ask to glorify your name to our highest capability, Lord. We pray it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Would you stand, please? Today is the greatest day in the Christian year. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 that this is the day that we're to remember with gladness that the heart of the gospel is the death, resurrection of Jesus. So as we come to that part in the Apostles' Creed when we talk about the crucifixion, about the resurrection, you might want to say it a little bit louder, emphasize it, pay attention. What do we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the one holy and universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'd invite all the children who would like to come up front uh, to come sit on the steps with cousins. No? Okay. All right. Cousins and friends, brothers and sisters. All right. Happy Easter, y'all. Thank you, buddy. All right. I have something I want to show you. Now behind you, you have a flower that we always have in church on Easter Sunday. Those are called lilies, Easter lilies. And see how they kind of look like a trumpet, white trumpet. Aren't they beautiful? And this is a tree that's blooming right now. It blooms every spring in people's yards, out in the woods. Does anybody know what this is called? Anybody know? I'm going to give you a hint. Woo, woo. What's it called? A dog. Yeah, dog what? A dog flower. Close. It's a dog wood. Say dog wood. Dog wood tree. And the dog wood tree always blooms around Easter. And there are some things about this bloom that can teach us about Jesus. So let's look at those things. All right, the first thing is this comes off a tree, so this is wood. The cross Jesus died on was not like this beautiful brass cross over here. Look over here. This is so pretty in the church, isn't it? See how the candlelight's reflecting off of it? But Jesus died on a wooden cross. It had to be wooden because, remember, they nailed nails. They hammered nails through his wrists and his ankle to hold him to it. It was awful. So the wood of the tree reminds us of Jesus' cross. Now I want you to look at the shape of the flower. Can you see how it's a cross? See that? You see the shape that's just like a cross? See that just like that? So that reminds us of the cross. And then I want you to look on the end of every white petal. What color do you see there? You see, see that? Well, it's supposed to be burgundy. Here's one that's burgundy. Kind of red. See that right there? Right there at the very end. So what do you think that red might remind us of? Blood. Whose blood? The blood of Jesus, right? Can you see it, darling? Can you see right there? All right. And then there's something else also that reminds us of Jesus. I want you to look right in the middle of these petals. Those little stamen is what they're called, and they look like the crown of thorns that Jesus wore. Remember the Bible says that he was the king of kings, 
And some of the soldiers who were getting ready to beat Jesus made fun of him. They whipped him in the face, they struck him, and they made a crown of thorns out of thorny plants and put it on his head, and they mocked him. They said, Hail, King of the Jews! Well, they didn't know, but he really is the king, isn't he? He showed his great love for us on that cross. And then the white reminds us of heaven, of eternal life. So on Easter, we remember that Jesus came out of the tomb. He was alive. He'll never, ever die again. And when we trust Him, we love Him, we believe in Him, that means that we'll live forever too. So this is what kind of a tree? Dogwood. Dogwood tree, right? And the flowers remind us of who? On the... And when He came out of the... The tomb. You got it. All right, Miss Lisa, will you take that to Children's Church? Okay. Will you put your hands together? All right, and let's pray. I want you to say what I say. Father, I love you. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh-oh. through the giving of our tithes and our offerings.
Let's pray together. We're grateful, Father, for all the gifts of this life. And we're even more grateful for the promise of the life to come when we trust in Jesus. We acknowledge that we are the beneficiaries of the greatest amount of gifts any group of Christians have ever known throughout history. We thank you, God, for freedom of religion, freedom of speech. We thank you for the great amount of income you've allowed us to have. And we ask you to help us to be generous. Help us to give sacrificially. That the work of this church and so many others, that the ministry of this church and so many others far beyond the walls of the church would continue unabated and even stronger through the rest of this year. Bless each gift, each giver, and each recipient in Christ's holy name. Amen. Please be seated. Throughout the Bible, there are so many prophecies, most of them about the coming of Jesus Christ. And so in the Old Testament, I've picked out as our lesson Psalm 16, beginning with the ninth verse and reading through the 11th. This is a very specific prophecy of Jesus' resurrection. Let's listen. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And then from the New Testament, our lesson comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, beginning with the 45th verse, and then reading through the 28th chapter to verse 10. The greatest story ever told, the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, that is, from noon until 3 p.m., darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. And the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs. And after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. A prefiguring of what will happen when Jesus returns. Verse 54. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely He was the Son of God. Many women were there, watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for His needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, 
and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, that is Saturday, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. There's humor in the Bible. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. This is God's Word. Let's treasure it. Let's bow our heads. Master, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For we acknowledge you alone as our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. One morning last week after I had told a group of children in our preschool the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, I asked them if they thought they could remember the story and tell it to someone else, maybe their parents, maybe a friend. Most of them said, yes, we can, Pastor Tim. Some of them gave me a thumbs up, but one little girl said, I won't remember it by the time I get home. She was being honest, wasn't she? We need to remember the story of Jesus. And I think that little girl will remember it too. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is the greatest story ever told. He is the only person who came back from the dead and never died again. Now I'm fascinated by stories. You've probably read some of them. Stories in magazines, or you might hear it on a podcast about people who die. I've spoken to one of them, and they're brought back, and they tell you magnificent things about heaven or horrible things about hell. We have a story in the Bible about a man named Lazarus, a good friend of Jesus. Jesus brings him back to life after three days, but he died again. Jesus will never die again. He is alive forever. And furthermore, it's the greatest story ever told because Jesus is the only one who promises that those who believe in Him will be raised from the dead and live with Him forever in heaven. All the other so-called prophets of every other religion are dead. And those who are preaching things now that are not Christian will one day die. Our prophet 
our leader is alive. And so I want to share with you some of the key points in the historical narrative of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. These are ground in facts. These are historical facts that are in history. They're ground in history. They're there. We know them. They've been proven by all kinds of ways. By people who lived in that day who wrote about them. By the way people's lives were changed. By places and names and dates and people that had been found through archaeology. And it begins with a horrible thing called crucifixion. It ought to touch our hearts very poignantly that God decided that Jesus would die when capital punishment was the most horrific it has ever been. Crucifixion was the most horrible way any group of people ever, ever designed for criminals to die. In fact, we get a word from it, excruciating, out of the cross. Two robbers were crucified with Jesus, one on his right, the other on his left. They had committed crimes. Jesus never did anything wrong. He was crucified for our mistakes, for our sins. About the ninth hour we read in the 46th verse, so about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. He pushed himself up on that little peg and he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me of all people? The humanity of Jesus, the divinity of Jesus, all together, 100%, Jesus was aching. He'd never been forsaken by his Father. He was forsaken so you and I wouldn't be forsaken. Don't miss that. Please don't miss that. And then a few verses later, when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, He's in charge of what's going on, He gave up His Spirit. The Son of God died. We call it Good Friday because it was good for us. But it was the saddest day in history. Joseph, a follower of Jesus, though secretively for a while and up until this point, took Jesus' body, his dead body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own tomb that had been cut out of a rock. He had a big stone rolled in front of the entrance. And the reason was to keep people out. Lo and behold, the next day the chief priests and the Pharisees made the tomb secure, so they thought, by putting a seal on the stone, a wax seal, and posting the guard. They really thought they could stop Jesus from coming out of that cave. The prophecy was being fulfilled, meanwhile, Because you, O God, will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. When Jesus is resurrected, there is no decay in His body. The wounds are there, the horrible, terrible wounds, but no decay in that arid climate. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. It's why we worship on Sundays now. Did you notice that the men don't go until the women tell them? The first preachers of the gospel were women. The men were cowering, they were hiding out. It's one of the historical evidences we have of the gospel. Because in that day, women could not testify in court. Women had no power whatsoever. But they were the first to see Jesus, and that's why the Bible tells it that way. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord had come down from heaven, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. Can't you see him there? 
So bright, so powerful, so strong, all he had to do was just barely push. Maybe he just used his finger. God's warrior taking on the greatest army of the day, the Romans. The guards, in fact, were so afraid of him that they shook and they became like dead men. Wouldn't you have loved to have seen it? They were there to guard this dead man and they become like dead men? The angel tells the women, don't be afraid. In other words, don't be afraid like these men. Do not be afraid, for I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen just as He said. Come and see the place where He lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples. The women look in. They run. They hurry away from the tomb. They're afraid, yet they're filled with joy. And suddenly, Jesus meets them. Now, the way we have it translated makes it sound very stilted. Greetings. Jesus was saying, Hey, hello, it's me. I'm alive. No wonder the women, the Bible tells us, come to Him, clasp His feet, and worship Him. That's been the response to the resurrection ever since. It's our response today. We worship Him. Why is it the greatest story ever told? I think there are at least two reasons. The first is because it tells us the truth about our sin. And I don't care how young you are, how old you are, how detached you are from your mistakes, or how close you are to them, you know that you've done wrong. And sometimes when you're trying to go to sleep, you think, what am I going to do about this? Well, God's taking care of that. Paul tells us in Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Only one of the three possible remedies for sin is viable. There are three. And the first one is, this is what most people do. It's like a scale and they think, well, you know, if my good outweighs my bad, then I'm good to go and I'll go to heaven. We ought to know better than that. Our good is never going to outweigh our bad. Our bad outweighs our good. The only truly good person was Jesus. And even if you're not willfully breaking the Ten Commandments right now, there are things you're not doing, I'm not doing, that I should be doing. The scale thing is out. It doesn't work. The second remedy for sin is that it, it just doesn't matter. A third of our country now, the stats say, a third of the people in this country just don't believe anything about God or a God. It doesn't matter. They know better because they've been hurt and they've hurt others. And we live in a world with all kinds of sin. So that, that option's out. The third option, the only one that works, is that Jesus does for us what we can't do for ourselves. He saves us from our sins. It's a gift. Have you accepted it? The second reason that this is the greatest story ever told is because it tells us the truth about life after death. In every culture, in every place, through all of time, people have believed in life after death. We know intuitively, Ecclesiastes says, we know inside us that we're bound to live forever. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, By His power, God raised the Lord from the dead and He will raise us also. And so only one of three possible options about eternal life is good. Only one of them. The first option that I hear sometimes tragically as a Navy chaplain is, you know, chaps, I like you, man, you know, but I just don't believe in this heaven and hell stuff. 
There's nothing after this life. In fact, one sailor told me one time, you know, my old man said when you die, poof, it's over. That's it. What a horrible option. We know better intuitively the Bible tells us different. The second option is, since I've done so much bad, I'm going to go to hell. And I guess I might as well just enjoy this life while I can, even though the things that are supposedly so much fun hurt us and hurt other people. Well, I don't think hell's a very good option, so it's out too. The third option is heaven. That Jesus secured my place. He has opened the door and He's given me a room in heaven. It's mine. It's yours. Forever and ever and ever. Do you know the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection? Do you know it? I've done my best to tell you that story today. Many of you do know it, but you're like me and it's good to have a refresher. Many of you are not too sure about it. And I pray that the Holy Spirit works in your heart today. Others of you are beginning to think, that really makes sense. And it does. Do you believe the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? If you believe it, your sins are forgiven. You're going to heaven. And the people that you've loved and lost who loved Jesus before you, you're going to see them again. I can hardly wait. And then last, like I asked the preschool kids, can you tell someone the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? Can you? Please don't forget it before you get home. Share it with somebody. It's a common denominator from people who live in Shelby County to those who live in Mongolia and all the places in between. We need to know the story of Jesus. Let's pray together. Oh God, I thank you that down on the front pew, uh, a young man is translating from English into Mongolian the story of your son. I thank you that your Holy Spirit has preserved the Bible down through the ages, that we've learned this story also. And as we come to the table of our Lord, May we be reminded the great, great price that was paid for our redemption. In Jesus' name, amen. Would the elders serving the Lord's Supper please come to the table? At the early service, we ran out of juice. There was some more in the kitchen, of course, and we had this little pause that was not really uncomfortable. It, it made us thankful. And we have a full house today in answer to the prayers of many, many people that you're here. God brought you here. So we've got some more juice coming in. At Highland Heights, we ask you to hold the piece of bread when it comes to you. It looks good. I know it looks good, but please don't gobble it up right away. I want you to hold it and I want you to think about what it represents, Jesus' body on the cross. And the same thing with the cup of juice as the tray is passed down the pew. Please don't slurp it down quickly. Hold it and then we'll drink it together. This is Easter Sunday and it's important for you to know that in a Presbyterian church, you do not have to be a Presbyterian, you don't have to be a member of this church to take communion. You do have to be a Christian, someone who's professed faith and been baptized in the name of the Trinity. And so perhaps this is a time when you're thinking, that's what I need to do. And if that's the case, I need to talk to you. We'll welcome you with open arms. Let's bow our heads. 
Father, would you please sanctify these elements to that spiritual use to which you have ordained them? That we, your people, gathered here at the top of this hill may find our faith strengthened, may find grace more real to us than ever before. In Jesus' precious name, amen. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 11 that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, He took bread. And after giving thanks, as has been done in His name, He broke that bread and He gave it to His disciples. As I, ministering in His name, give this bread to you. He told them that evening in the upper room, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, You proclaim the Lord's death until He comes again. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have life everlasting.
Let's all taste and see that the Lord is good. The Bible tells us that after the same manner, our Savior also took the cup. And after having given thanks, as has been done in his name, he gave that cup to his disciples. As I, ministering in his name, give this cup to you. He told them that evening in the upper room, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for many for the remission of sins. All of you drink of it.
Paul tells us in Ephesians, it is by faith that we have been saved. It's through grace, not by anything we've done, lest anyone should boast. All over the world today, throughout this nation too, people are remembering that the blood of Jesus was shed for their salvation. Let's pray together again. Oh God, so many folks today will be eating some ham and some deviled eggs and probably some pound cake or some pie. Some chicken will have some good vegetables. We're so grateful that we have such an abundance of food. Help us to share more and more. But help us to know that the very best meal we'll have today is the meal we've just had. These tangible symbols of the sacrificial death and resurrection of our Savior. May this taste be on our lips and in our hearts forevermore. In His name, amen. Let's all stand together and sing from the depths of our spirit. From number 217, Christ the Lord is risen today.
Last Thursday when our service was over, Amah's stepfather hugged me in a big old bear hug out there in the lobby. Asian people don't usually do that. The Lord Jesus Christ is living in his heart. And he said through his stepson translating, he used to think that Jesus was bad. But now he knows Jesus is good. He used to think Christians were bad. Now he knows we're good. That's a story you need to share with somebody today. Thank God it's happened in our midst. I would love to talk to you about becoming a part of this church family. We'll welcome you with open arms. May God's grace, mercy, and peace be yours now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. From my family to yours, Happy Easter.